Hello, Malcolm here with the second class in our series, This Then Is How You Should Pray. Taken from Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching on prayer, part of uh, part, the second class of four classes on the Lord's Prayer. So today we're talking about verse 10. Last week we talked about verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This week, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And just a reminder that the context of this is Jesus teaching on prayer. Um, it teaches a lot on prayer here. But in particular, he's teaching them, as he says in verse 8, do not be like them. Do not be like the religionists, the hypocrites. Your father knows what you need. Don't babble and all that. So bear in mind that Jesus is not only teaching us how to pray, but in a sense, how not to pray. And also bear in mind that through the whole of this Lord's Prayer section, Jesus is not telling us exact words to say, but more teaching us how to pray. As he says, this then is how you should pray, not, this is the, not these are the exact words you should say. Quite a big difference there. So the idea is here we have themes that help us to pray well, effectively, and about the things that nurture our spiritual life and bring glory to God. So we're going to talk about two things today, and then we're also going to hear from Peju, which I hope uh, you'll find very encouraging. I think you will. But firstly, your kingdom come. The first phrase here, your kingdom come. The first phrase in verse 10. So what are we praying for when we're praying for God's kingdom to come? Now, this is a big topic, and if we had 10 hours, it wouldn't be enough. So I'm not going to try and teach a whole class on the kingdom, but at least draw out some things that are significant that help us to understand what we're praying for when we pray this prayer. So firstly, as far as the disciples' experience is concerned, those that are there in Matthew chapter 6 listening to Jesus, what are they hearing him say? I think there are three things or three aspects of the kingdom that are relevant to them then and will be relevant to them as time goes by, as they realize more fully what Jesus is talking about here. The first is this, as far as they're concerned, and they're only beginning to grasp this here in Matthew chapter 6, but the king is with them. The king of the kingdom is with them. So in one sense, they're, they're being taught that they are to pray for a kingdom that has already come, because the king is here. And if the king is here, then the kingdom is here. So there's a one sense in which the kingdom has already come because the kingdom is the king is present. Then secondly, the evidence of the kingdom's transformational power is still to come, but will come in their lifetime because they don't know that yet really fully here in Matthew chapter 6, but that's what's going to happen. In Mark chapter 9 verse 1 for example, Jesus said, "Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. When does the kingdom of God come with power? After his death, burial, and resurrection. Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Spirit. The kingdom comes with power. Resurrection, Holy Spirit, the power is evidenced. The power is released into the world. And the, and the apostles and others went forth telling the world about that. And that's why we're all here still today. So in that sense... The kingdom is still, for the disciples in Matthew 6, still to come, but is coming. So we've got the king present, and we've got the transformational power of the kingdom uh, shortly to break into their world in Acts 2. And then also we have that next part of the idea that the kingdom, ultimate evidence of the kingdom, ultimate reality of the fullness of the kingdom is still to come, not only for them, but for us also. Revelation 22 and verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So kingdom come. We pray for the kingdom to come. We're praying about that ultimate end of this world, this new earth. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So when we're praying about the kingdom coming, May your kingdom come. We're thinking about all of these elements. The king has already come. The king's transformational, transformative power has been released. And yet, and yet there is a, a final full reality of the kingdom still yet to come because the king is going to come back. All of that is involved in this prayer, I believe. 
again, the apostles only understood that in part in Matthew chapter 6, came to understand it better and better as they followed Jesus, listened to his teaching, and then of course experienced for themselves what happened in his resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So as far as we're concerned, you and I today, the kingdom has come and will come. The king reigns over you and me fully in one sense. He, uh, we've surrendered ourselves to him. When we said Jesus is Lord, we've said Jesus is king. He's sovereign over my life. So the king reigns in us and in a sense partially through us because as, we'll, as we influence the world, we bring about the reality of his kingdom to more and more people. We'll talk again more about that in a moment. So the king reigns over you and me fully. The king reigns through us into the world partially at this point. And the king will return to reign over all things at some point in the future. So what are we praying for? We're celebrating the current existence of the kingdom in its partial revelation through the king and his subjects. I'll repeat that. We're celebrating, when we pray your kingdom come, we're celebrating the current existence of the kingdom in its partial revelation through the king and his subjects, you and me. And additionally, we're praying for the day when the kingdom will be all in all. It will be expressed in all of its fullness, the new heaven and the new earth, the kingdom in its fullness. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. So that's the first thing about the kingdom. When we pray, uh, your kingdom come, that's, those are the themes that are in our minds and our hearts as we're praying, may the kingdom come. So we've explored that first part, your kingdom come. Now we're going to go on to the second phrase, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what we're talking about here, what are we praying for when we're praying and asking God for his heavenly will to be done here on earth. Let's talk about King Jesus for a moment. God's will done on earth cannot be understood without looking at the life of Jesus. And when we look at the life of Jesus, we understand what God's heavenly will looks like here on earth. It's not very complicated, not to say that it's easy, but it is not actually very complicated. What was King Jesus's life all about? Maybe we could take uh, Luke 4, 16 to 21 as a way of understanding it. He stood up to read in the synagogue. And the scroll of the prophet was ha Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it, and he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back, sat down, the eyes of everybody fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, God's vision for humankind, for community and relationship with him and relationship with one another and harmony on earth. Jesus said, I've come to bring this about. King Jesus is here. The king has come to say what, I, what my father's vision is, is now a reality through me. That's part of what's going on here. What did Jesus say in John chapter 4, verse 34? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus saw his mission as being one to bring about God's will on the earth. And how did that, what did that look like? I mean, so much we could talk about, but just very briefly, it looked like courageous, loving action. Courageous loving action. His trust in the Father, his faith in the Father meant that he took courageous, loving action. And of course, you're going to need to do that to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, setting the oppressed free, all of those things, which of course, Jesus found the word of those in opposition to him. That's what's going to happen. So that's Jesus. I wish we had more time, but that's Jesus, courageous, loving action. He went around doing good, it says in the book of Acts. What about his followers? What does that, what does that mean for us to then, as the followers of the king who came to do these things, what does it mean for us to live out the kingdom? What we're praying for, I think, is, is the Beatitudes 
to become a reality in our lives, to live what you might call a beatitudinal life. Poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hunger and thirsting for righteousness, merciful, being pure of heart, being a peacemaker, and understanding that being persecuted for righteousness sake is part of the package and is indeed a blessing, not just to you, but perhaps to the world. This kind of life evidences the king's arrival and the kingdom's arrival. Being salt and light, in fact, as he goes on to talk about in Matthew chapter 5, being salt and light so that God's kingdom become a more and more of a reality, more and more visible. So there's a personal application here to the individual follower, but there's also a corporate group application because the Lord's Prayer is about we and us, not just about me and my. So as we're praying this prayer, may your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as in heaven. We're praying personally and we're praying for us as followers of Christ, our location, our family group, our church, our community of faith, that we would be these people who would express the kingdom realities, the kingdom values, the kingdom priorities here on this earth, and the world will see. The world saw it in Jesus. The world sees it in his followers. So we're looking at that. And then the church age, if you like, which came after Jesus and the first apostles in the Gospels, the church age in which we now live means something like this. It means that we are carrying forward the mission of God to express the kingdom, to reveal the kingdom, to invite more and more people into it and to enjoy it such that God's mighty mission to heal what happened in Eden, to heal the hurt of Eden, to heal the damage of Eden, to heal the break, the breakage between the relationship with humankind and God and indeed the, the damage in our own relationships on this, so that this would be healed and that this healing becomes an ever-present, ever more present, ever more growing reality to an ever larger number of people. And that has a positive effect on humankind and on the globe, on our environment. All that is damaged is becoming more and more healed. Hearts are healed, spirits are healed, Justice is healed, lives are healed, relationships are healed, the environment is healed. This is what we're praying for. We're praying for that perfection. We're praying for that ideal. We're praying for what was in Eden to be a reality now. And although, and although in our lifetime it won't become a full reality, we can bring it to become more and more of a reality so that people can see there is an alternative. There's a better way to live. God is present. He is making a difference through his people who live a kingdom life. And so this is the beatitudinal life that brings about the reality of the kingdom for the rest of humankind so that God can be glorified. So you see how much we're praying for here in this prayer, these few words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, have a, we, have a, we have the most incredible privilege and responsibility to live this out. So in summary, 2 Peter 3, verse 13. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So ultimately, after King Jesus and after the outpouring of his power and after the church age, there comes this time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. All will be made new. We're praying in anticipation and living in anticipation of that day. So what does it mean for us in between? It means that we're spurred on to evangelism, to telling the good news, because the new world will contain multitudes of nations. Matthew 28 and Revelation talk about that. I'm going to put some extra scriptures in the show notes, by the way. We're spurred on in the meantime also to social action because the new world will be a place where righteousness dwells, as it says in that passage in 2 Peter 3. Righteousness dwells. In other words, everything that is done right. People treat each other right. We do right by God and we do right by one another. We treat people with the, the love for, for our neighbor that Jesus taught us to have. And we do that in all of its fullness. We do that now in anticipation of it being done in perfection in the future, in this new heaven and new earth. That's how we live. And we're spurred on to love life, to love the life that God has given us, to live it in its fullness, 
The references in Revelation and Isaiah to the wealth and the honor of the nations coming to Jerusalem or Zion or by application to, uh, to the kingdom, into the kingdom, they, they, these things teach us to be richly involved with all that is best in the arts and the sciences. It teaches us to value beauty. It teaches us to be creative and value creativity because these are things of God. He's made them and he's going to perfect them. We're spurred on in that way. Let me give you a quote here by N.T. Wright from his book, Surprised by Hope. He said this, The world has already been turned upside down. That's what Easter is all about. It isn't a matter of waiting until God does something different at the end of time. God has brought his future, his putting the world to rights future, into the present in Jesus of Nazareth. And he wants that future to be implicated more and more in the present. That's what we pray for every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we're doing, my friends. When we pray this prayer, we're asking God to help us and to strengthen us to be the, the kingdom people that will be salt and light and bring the reality of the kingdom into, the, into this world and help other people know how wonderful this alternative way of living really is. And now Paige is going to share a few thoughts. And I was just thinking back to the start of lockdown and the spread of the virus where I was personally praying for God's will to be done in the world, for his kingdom to spread um, in just the world that seemed so uncertain and so confused and so crazy at that time. God, let your will be done, let your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth at this time as it is in heaven. And I remember getting this sense as I was pondering and praying and meditating on that specific part of the Lord's Prayer where the Spirit was saying back to me, for all of you Christians, which you included, who are praying this, do you realize that God's will being done on this earth also means you are opening up, opening up your lives for God's will to be done. So it's not just well and good to say, God, your will be done on this earth, in those people's lives, in this political situation, in this pandemic. Actually, the impact of that prayer also means my life and our lives as Christians are also laid bare before God to come and do his will in our world. And that meant being able to admit to the greed in my life um, with, yeah, just the way I'd been shopping for provisions prior to the lockdown, willy-nilly whenever I wanted stuff. And I was just reminded that actually praying that prayer for myself personally and as Christians, praying that prayer for God's will to be done also made me aware that God wants to do his will first and foremost in our lives, his will in our lives to expose the areas that are not pleasing to him, whether that's greed of many kinds or prejudice or uh, a lack of love, a lack of forgiveness, just whatever it was in that time that, uh, God's will needed to be done in, were we ready as a church, as a body of faithful believers, were we also ready to open up our world, our personal world, our inner world, our faith world and lives for God's will to be done? That was a big question. That was an eye opener. That was a wrestle and a struggle. But yeah, that was um, what I wanted to share. So to conclude, I've got a couple of questions for us to, to uh, discuss in our times together with our family groups or whoever we're watching this uh, with or listening to. What stands out to you from this verse 10? 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What stands out to you? And how might your prayer life grow? How might it develop? How might it mature as you think about this verse and pray it? Maybe you'd like to pray it every day, as I have been doing recently. Why not pray it every day for the next two weeks until we have our third class on the next verse, give us today our daily bread in verse 11. If you've got any questions about any of this, drop me a line at malcolm at malcolmcox.org. And if you've got any comments, you can share them and let me know what's helpful. And if you'd like to share in the next two classes on the themes of verse 11, 12, and 13, let me know because I'd love to have other voices involved too. Thanks very much. Take care and God bless.